Welcome to my lecture on the canons of rhetoric. These are the five public speaking basics. If you are in a future public speaking situation, um, take these with you. I mean, these, this is what you need to know to get you through all speeches in the future. So again, these are called the canons of rhetoric, the five public speaking basics. They are invention, style, disposition, memory, and delivery. So the first canon is invention. This is extremely important because the invention canon is all about the audience. This is where you sit down and you ask yourself, you know, questions like, to who am I speaking? You know, what are the demographics of this audience? Age, gender, things like that. Where are they from? What do they like? What do they don't like? This is where you decide what is the best topic for them. Um, what, did, what, what could, could potentially persuade them? So good public speakers are always audience focused. It's always about the audience. Who are these people that I'm speaking to? So if I'm speaking to a bunch of students at Valley College, I used to teach at USC and I used to work with their executive MBA program, it would be different speaking to them versus speaking to my students here versus some of you saw my graduation speech versus speaking to 500 plus people at graduation. I always have to take those people and that audience into consideration when I'm crafting my speech. As you're crafting your speech, you're thinking about your audience, but you're also deciding on the language that you're going to deliver to your audience, and that's the style stage. The style canon is also called the language stage. Good public speakers, they are aware of the appropriate language for their audience. It's all about word choice, because when you get up here and you did your introductory speech and you talk about you, you crafted the world of you through the word choices that you use to describe yourself. When you do your cultural narrative speech or your persuasive speech or your informative speech, you need to be very conscious of your word choices because our insight into that topic in many ways only comes from you talking about it. So there are two general aspects. I, I could spend, and I do in my classes, sometimes I spend an entire class talking about language, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to talk about two specific aspects of language. Denotation, connotation, and reflection, deflection. So first, denotation. Denotation is the dictionary definition of a word. So if you were to look up dog in the dictionary, you might get something like four-legged canine mammal. But if I were to ask you what you thought about dogs, some of you love dogs, some of you don't like dogs, some of you love big dogs, some of you like small dogs, some of you are dog people. I've had students in my class that are deathly afraid of dogs. So you have to be careful of that because all of us probably perceive of dogness differently. So where you have something in your head, it's a connotation, you might actually think it's the denotation, which is the dictionary definition. Connotation is the meanings we attach to it. So we have different meanings. So when you're up here delivering your speech, you have to take into consideration the meanings that the audience members could potentially attach to the words that you are using for their audience. And that relates to language reflection and deflection. The point of this is the words that you choose reflect who you are, and they deflect who you could be, right? So the first day of class, I might come up here and I could say, they just match if I said, hello, boys and girls, my name is Professor Miller. That's a reflection of who I am, versus hello, men and women, my name is Professor Miller, or hello, students, or hello, males and females, whatever I might say, ladies and gentlemen, each one of those has different sort of connotations. And that's going to affect how you see me. So those, by, by saying girls and boys as a reflection of who I am, I'm also deflecting the other things that I could call you. So I deflect who I could be. So that, that's really important. You know, people say, well, years ago I had a student in class who used the B word in class. And some of the students got upset, rightfully so. And he said, well, that, and they critiqued him for it. And he said, I'm not that type of person. But when you use that type of language, you get perceived as that type of person. Therefore, you kind of are, right? So every utterance is half-owned. So when I put some language out there, it's my intentionality, but it's also how you receive it, how you perceive it, and together we create the reality of that language. So the best public speakers, they are aware of those language implications and what that could mean to your audience. So you always want to be mindful of your audience and the language choices that you're making for them. The next canon is called disposition. This is your organizational canon. So obviously, as I talked about in the Aristotelian outline, that's why it says go here, see Aristotelian outline. I'm not gonna go too deep into that um, because I already have a video on how to organize the speech. But what you need to recognize is that 
You need to be organized. Think about the professors or the people that you have around your life that are disorganized, as opposed to the ones that are. So when you are delivering a speech, the more organized your performance is, the more likely we are to understand it, to retain it, to like it. So that's why you always want to, as you're constructing and as you're writing, as you're thinking about your audience, you're also developing an organizational structure. So see my video on Aristotelian Outline for how to sort of break that down. Next, we have memory. So you have your speech, and you have to decide how are you going to present your speech to your audience. There are four different ways to communicate with an audience. There's memorize. Memorize, and some of you have seen you do memorize speeches. It's good and bad. So when you watch the videos from the NFA final round, you will see that all of those speeches have to be memorized. For public speaking competition, a key element of it is memorization. But some of it sounds a little bit artificial, um, but we still have to have it. So what, what you do when you create a memorized speech is you have to be able to make it sound like it's not fully memorized. And that's the problem with memorization is that there are two big problems with memorization. So the first problem is that some people, what they do is they just speak and then And then they forget, and, and I see that happen a lot. So you don't have to memorize your speeches for my class. Another problem with memorization is that people, they just stand there and they deliver their speech. They usually get really stiff and they kind of sound memorized. Today I'm going to introduce you to my topic. My topic is on trees. I like trees. You should too. So they sound sort of flax and inorganic. So the best memorized speeches are those ones that still have a sense of... Um, life to them, right? So they're fun. You still want to listen to them. So be careful of memorization. The next one is impromptu. Impromptu means you're making it up as you're going along. That doesn't mean you're not prepared, right? So that so there's an invented competition called impromptu, and I love watching it, especially when you get to the final rounds of nationals and things like that, because you see some great speeches. And these students have to know a lot about a lot, because from one round to the next, they don't know what they're going to have to interpret. You know, each, each round, they're given a separate quotation, a different quotation. So impromptu, you, you are prepared. So for example, if I'm in a class and I'm lecturing, I have to know a lot about the material I'm lecturing on. Because if students ask me questions, my response is an impromptu response to that question. So making up as you're going along is a skill. The next one is manuscript reading. Um, this is kind of what you're doing for this class. And this is when you write out your entire script and then you read from it. Now, just so you know, when you're reading from your, when, from your speech, your informative and persuasive, it does not have to be word for word. It just needs to stick to it primarily. The problem with manuscript reading, and this is something I recognize when I have you do manuscript as opposed to extemporaneous outlining, I'll talk about that in a sec, is that people have a tendency just to stand here and read. And that can be very mind-numbing as an audience member and very frustrating as an audience member. When somebody just puts a script, and I've literally had people, as they read, even though I suggest note cards, they'll bring full sheets of paper and then cover their face with a full sheet of paper. Today I'm going to talk to you about blah, blah, blah. The problem with reading is that you get fat, uh, you go too fast usually, you get very flat and monotone, and we lose interest quickly. Because what you're not doing is you're not speaking to your audience. You're not making eye contact with your audience. You're just focusing on a sheet of paper. So that's not public speaking. That is public reading. The next one we have is what's called extemporaneous speaking. Extemporaneous speaking means speaking from notes, which is pretty much what I'm doing here. Right? So I have this information up here. I have my outline, and I'm speaking from my outline. This doesn't mean I haven't practiced this. So speaking to a computer like this is a lot different than speaking to a class. It's much less dynamic. I don't, I don't feed off the energy of the class. So I had to say all of this out loud and practice it first before I decided to deliver it for a, you know, my, my video audience. It's, it's, it's a strange feeling to be up here, I have to admit. But extemporaneous speaking means that you know your topic well, and you can explain it well, so you just need memory prompts to then speak from it. So a question I've been asked is, why do I have students write out their entire speech as opposed to sort of an outline where they can use extemporaneous speaking? The reason why is that I've had students outline, and I have not seen an increase in the quality of delivery, outline versus manuscript reading. So I decided to fully go to manuscript writing, and then hopefully you practice it enough that it doesn't sound memorized or it doesn't sound uh, flat and monotone. Because at least what you do is you get practice writing using the Aristotelian structure. So you leave with that very important skill. I will err on the side of possibly a little bit more 
public reading if I see that I can help you write better. Okay? Finally, we have delivery. Now, delivery, I personally argue, is the most important canon because you can have a beautifully written speech. And I've seen, I've seen beautifully written speeches in front of my class, but if they're standing there and they're not using proper nonverbals, they're not making eye contact and communicating with an audience, they stand, they stand there and they're flat and monotone, the students are going to stop listening. Okay? So it's that combination. You write it well, and then you practice the delivery. That's what makes for a good speech. I'll talk more about delivery in my lecture on nonverbal communication. That's it for the Canons of Rhetoric for now.